Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Okay, and for anyone listening at home, we are live streaming to our private community on Facebook, and we will be checking in through the episode at the chat to see if there's any questions, comments, or stories to share from them. Yes, we put it to a vote in our Facebook community group, and the most popular choice was, but I can't eat in moderation. So we're going to talk about this idea of eating in moderation and what Mm. that means. We can go ahead and see what the definitions of those words are. And then I want to hear your perspective on the word itself, because I have one. When we recorded an episode on intuition, Steph and I had both looked up the Google definition, and it turns out it meant something different, slightly different. The wording was a bit different in the US as the UK. So it might be that moderation means something completely different to me as it does to you. So shall I read that what we've got on the British yep, go definition? Ahead. We haven't pre done this by the way this is yes so we don't know they might be exactly the same but last time it was just interesting how intuition apparently you americans experience intuition differently to us let's see when it comes to moderation so google dictionary says the avoidance of excess or extremes especially in one's behavior or political opinions have you got the same same exact the action of making something less extreme intense or violent that's the secondary definition Oh, the secondary so, definition, it starts talking about examination papers here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, no, don't have that. Um, but I also have underneath it, it says phrases. It uses examples of phrases. It says in moderation means within reasonable limits, not to excess. Quote, nuts can be eaten in moderation. How interesting. Ah, interesting, How interesting. with the food. Yeah. And nuts yeah. all foods as well. Yeah, nuts. I ate lots of nuts, by the way. Yeah. What is was... reasonable? What does that mean? That's I know. That's silly. That's so silly. Well, you know what? It's probably innocuous enough, but this is the issue I have with the word is that words like reasonable, like when you define, when you define a word through another vague word or another word that's up to interpretation, someone's going to go interpret that. So that's what diet culture does. And that's why I don't like the word moderation, because I I think it probably started out with a meaning that was more or less, okay, you know, fine. But I think it's like, well, moderation now means as little as possible. It means more of that diet culture, um, like watch yourself. And I, and I've posted about this before. And I think that that word has absorbed that feeling. It's absorbed that connotation of moderation means as little as possible. Um, what is reasonable means as little as possible or a small, a smallish amount, an amount that would be conducive to weight loss. To me, I feel like that's the way that I really hear that word after years and years of trying to eat in moderation. And I'm not saying this is going to be true for everybody, but those of us are susceptible to hearing that and hearing it through diet culture narratives may associate that word with something more suffocating than it's intended. So if I substituted the word moderation for balance, how is that different for you? Is it different for you? And how? I think they're all of these words have been kind of taken over. Um, Balance, moderation, like they sound really reasonable, not to use that word again, but like they sound totally like, yeah, of course, that's what we want. And, And to a degree, I can understand that. And that is what I inherently feel you know, there's a, there's a positive association inside of me when I define that word for myself. But I just think that when we talk about the word, it's often being talked about in conjunction with eat in balance, meaning don't eat too much of this type of food or that type of food and, and really not even that much of it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't think we, we have a clear understanding of what too much is. So then what is it we're trying to do if we're not going it's about avoiding extremes and I get that that is very much in line with how I would think about it and how I would think about what people are trying to do what word can we use because it seems like almost every word is problematic in some way yeah I think we can use it I think we just need to clarify it 
which I do. Like I, I do find myself using the word balance sometimes, but I just make sure that I, I clarify that it's not to say that it's not a moral balancing. It's not meant in the same way that we may be used to sort of absorbing that word and needing to follow this balance. I also think it's confusing because the way that I recovered from binge eating required me to be eating in, ext in an extreme way, right? Like, so I couldn't go to balance and moderation initially. So it's this idea of why can't I just eat in moderation? Why can't I just be balanced or not so extreme? And, and for me personally, there was extremism involved. I had to swing that pendulum back to the other side in order to get to this place of moderation. So I think I think sometimes using the word as a goal can needs need some interpretation too because it's not something you can just necessarily jump to when it's part of an overarching process of a pendulum swinging back and forth before landing in the middle mm -hmm. or in balance. So I think for me maybe it was just the other way around because my more extreme was over when I was binge eating. And I think for you, although there was binge eating, it was a very restrictive mindset, a very restrictive period. So you did swing the other way. But what about for those of us who are not in a restrictive mindset, then where are we swinging to? Do you see what I mean? For me, mm -hmm. it actually went more from the extreme into something more balanced mm -hmm. because I was already over yeah. here a lot. And yeah. that doesn't mean to, that there was still swinging going on, but I don't know that mine was as extreme yeah. in comparison to what yeah, I was already I, I doing at that, that time. Yeah, I can see that. Um, but interestingly, prior to my recovery, I was in a restrictive mindset, but I was binging as hard as I was restricting, right? So it's not like I was mostly restricting with occasional binges. I was, it was equal. It was really extreme on both sides. I guess it's not the word itself, but maybe the idea of how easily we're supposed to be able to do that. Um, it sounds really simple. It sounds like just eat in moderation. And it's, it's I think, more complicated than it, than it sounds. Agreed. We've got a comment from one of our community members who is joining us live at the moment, and that's from Leanne. And Leanne says, moderation speaks to me as similar to portion control, like eating a typical portion would be moderate, but then each person will need differing quantity. Like for me, example, there is no way I could not be hungry if I ate a recommended portion of porridge, for example. It wouldn't fill me up. Yeah. Oh my goodness, like portions of porridge though, right? Yeah. Or and cereal, from, any of that. Oh, please. Yeah. yeah. And like, <laughs> and from a caloric perspective, it, that's not a meal. It's not enough uh, no. energy to be a from, meal. Even caloric, like the caloric recommendations, even the 2000 calorie RDA, 2000 to me is not enough. So a portion control moderation as defined by the status quo would not apply to me. So I would be fighting that all the time. And I think that is what kept me in a binge response for so long as I thought I was supposed to be eating moderately at 2000 calories a day. And that simply was not, that was not for me. Like I, I couldn't, that was under what I needed. Mm -hmm. I fell into a bit of a hole online when I was thinking about this episode and I was just Googling eating in moderation and seeing what people were saying about it online. And there were a lot of very diety articles, but they were even saying that the concept of eating in moderation is a problematic phrase because what is considered moderation to one person right. is very different to what's considered moderation to someone else. I can remember feeling like it was a big success when I would bought a whole load of binge foods and I maybe I ate a quarter of it. When to anyone who didn't binge, perhaps they would look at that and I'd eaten a lot of food. But in that moment, the fact that I'd had a moment where I'd been able to stop after 25% was an incredible thing for me. So mm. judging it by the amounts, I think that's problematic, as is it being used as advice, you know. How many times are people told, or how many people have heard, eat what you want, just eat it in moderation? Right. Yeah. Oh, I hate that so much. You're just making me angry. It's just useless. It's not, it's not helpful for people. That's well, it's like problem. people know. That's not new information. You know, it's, it's like, well, well, yeah. Well, yeah. If I could do that, I would do that. <laughs> you mean eat less? That's what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. More complicated. Yeah, and, and dismissive, dismissive of, of, of personal experience. I think as well that when, certainly for me, when I was thinking I'm just so out of control and incapable of eating of any kind of moderation, what I do is look around for indicators of what moderation is. 
Mm-hmm. So that was the whole looking outside of myself that I think I was stuck in for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And with all the things that were out there, I mean, intermittent fasting sounded like a really moderate approach to food control at that time. As with portion controls, like Leanne mentioned as well, all of those things, again, it's the danger of looking outside when it feels like from the felt perspective, you don't know what moderation feels like for you. Yeah. This is the appeal of what I eat in a day posts and blogs, right? Like, what are you doing? How can I do that? Or even the 80-20 rule, which did I, do you subscribe to that? Did you talk about that somewhere? I don't think so. I mean, I didn't talk about it as in promote it. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this idea of 80-20, which for anyone unfamiliar is like this idea of 80% of the time we eat well, we eat healthy, and 20% of the time you just have fun and eat the, the pizza and the ice cream. You know, like this is often how it's presented. And that to me, that's kind of under the, the moderation mentality. But to me, it's like anytime you're assigning what the percentage needs to be or what the amounts are, you're going to have rebel rousers inside being like, oh, yeah? Well, what if I do 70, 30, you know, I think the whole idea of not tapping in, there are days where eating in balance to me now looks a whole lot different than what eating in balance would look to me the next day, just because my context changes so much. So I have to know what that looks like for me on any given day based on how I feel about it, which is the, it's not a, a flexibility that we get when we're defining moderation from the outside. Mm-hmm. We've got a comment from somebody joining us live from Melissa saying could say eat to satisfaction but the idea of moderation would dictate that satisfaction is okay only if your personal level of satisfaction is reasonable and acceptable to the expectations of others or the greater good so yeah it's that whole not trusting ourselves to say yeah "Mm, this is my level of satisfaction and even eating to satisfaction can become a rule yes yes I often will see satisfaction being interpreted as physical, like physical satisfaction. Like when you feel like your stomach is reasonably full, reasonably, see, (laughs) Um, you know, it's full. And that's where we should stop when in fact, there's sometimes a lot of this mental hunger where that's not satisfied yet. And I think sometimes with, particularly with those who binge eat, this is, this is part of that shame. It's like, I can't, I consistently have this mental hunger and I'm not satisfied where I should be satisfied. And I disagree with that, especially as we heal, that a lot of that mental hunger and the satisfaction through mental hunger beyond physical hunger is sometimes really necessary for healing. I think where people feel stressed, though, is that they can't seem to reach that physical or that emotional satisfaction with food. Yeah. Because at least for me, sometimes I was chasing satisfaction in food where because of where I was in that moment, how I was feeling and what was going on, it would not have been possible for me to reach any kind of satiation point with food. Yeah. Well, this is what a binge is. To me, that's like what a binge felt like. Yeah. Agreed. Like it was just where you would be physically in pain from food. Like I would lay down at night sometimes being like, how am I going to sleep? I am. I am full. Like I am so full. I've never been this full feeling like I could probably still eat more. You know what I mean? I could keep going, but I think that was a lot to do with shame and feeling like I'd done something terribly wrong and needing to stay in that escapism, right? Needing to not stop eating because then I'd have to think about what I just done. To me, that was a big part of what prevented that satisfaction from happening. I could feel the two differently, not so much at the time when there was a lot of confusion, but I remember when my binge eating started trying to explain to my mother, I think at the time, I remember saying, it's like, I've I've eaten, I know I've eaten, because I feel full, my stomach feels uncomfortably full. But I feel like I haven't eaten. Mm. So it was like knowing that I'd eaten, but feeling like I hadn't that kind of splitting, that's what happened right at the beginning. And I felt that really intensely, a a really visceral, like Mm. physiological feeling. And then later on went all the guilt, because there wasn't a lot of guilt and shame right at the beginning, just confusion. Yeah. But when all the guilt and shame came in as well, that's when it started leaning into what yeah. you described then, not wanting to come back to myself and having right. to sit Well, that with- beginning, that feeling you're describing of knowing you're full, but not feeling like you've eaten to me sounds like what extreme hunger felt like. 
and I guess that would require a definition of what extreme hunger is, but it's this, it's a distinct feeling of being that bottomless pit syndrome where it's not, yeah, you're right. There's a binge that is like, I know I'm full and I'm extremely uncomfortable. I'm, I feel the fullness and I'm keep on eating because of there's some that emotional pull versus this, like I've eaten a very large meal and I know I'm full, but I feel like I could just keep eating and that, that hunger is not satisfied yet. Um, which I would like, that was a distinct part of what extreme hunger felt like. It literally feels like hunger. It feels like you're still hungry. Yes. Whereas the other feels like you you know you're not hungry. You know you're just eating. Yes. Which was yeah. so confusing to me because that kicked off after such a such a brief period of not extreme restriction. Yeah. It doesn't That's take why. much. No. It really doesn't. I recently had a message from somebody um, on Instagram who has a big following, like over a hundred thousand followers, and they follow a certain diet and they post all about the diet. And she said, I, I think I've just realized that actually it's this binge mentality that's going on. And I think I'm seeing in all my followers as well. I was like, mm -mm. yes, oh. check out Life After Diets. Come join us. Because if, if we can nice. convert her step, then we can, <laughs> we can have a bigger reach community. The other, because it, it's yeah. so like this idea that if you do dieting right, then it's safe, then you're not going to have this reaction. And maybe some people don't. And that's the confusing part as well. But yeah, I, I don't agree. think, yeah. yeah, I don't, it's not the case for everyone, for whatever reasons. Yeah. But what, what are those reasons, Steph? I think when you're naturally smaller, like when you have genetic, a genetic blueprint, that's just smaller, smaller bodied, I think dieting doesn't have as big of an effect because you're not pushing the envelope so as much like your body's not as threatened by weight loss because it might be comfortable there anyway. Um, yeah, that's, mm, that's I'm not sure I agree with that because I, I think that's I where I started and that I was very but maybe friendly. your set point changed. Maybe. I feel like we've gone way off the topic of moderation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't, we can go down. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that for another episode jargon aside and all of that like when we're when we're kind of coming down to that more common sense definition of even attuning internally to what moderation might feel like why is it so hard the first thing that popped into my head it's not going to be the only thing it was just the first one that came up for me is I think that people with uh, female hormones and hormonal cycles I think that our appetites fluctuate more and then culturally we've got all these messages about how much we should be eating so my food intake now I, I ride with it and I, I expect these fluctuations and I go with it and actually trying to just eat the same amount every day even if it was plenty of food just felt it felt wrong and felt like I wasn't in tune with my natural I don't like to say natural appetite because that's not helpful but with the the cycles and moods of my body and yeah. my mind because some of it's mm -hmm. Um, mental too. Last weekend, I, I feel like I tell the story a lot. <laughs> Clearly it happens regularly. Is it about ice cream cake? No, it's not. I know it's my second favorite story. Saturday, I was really hungry. Sunday, I was really hungry. Now it's a time in my cycle that I tend to get really hungry. So it's kind of predictable at this point. It didn't used to be because my cycle was also all over the map, but now my period is regular and I have a predictable pattern of this hunger coming. And it usually lasts for one to two days. Well, Saturday it was there, Sunday it was there, and I was eating beyond what somebody might call moderation, right? Like I was eating more than I usually do. And then Monday morning came and it was still there. I woke up in the morning and I was like, I am hungry. Like I am hungry and I've been eating a good amount over the weekend and I'm still hungry. And I'm like, okay, well, all right. And then we continue. And then Tuesday morning was the same. And this is longer than typical, right? So it was at this moment that I was like, this is the moment where before I would have been like, this is ridiculous. This is not okay. This isn't right. Something about this isn't right. My body's broken. I don't know how to eat moderately. And at that point, I probably would have started binging. Um, but I'm feeling back to baseline since yesterday. And it's almost like, it's almost like, it's like, oh, where did that go? Okay. Well, that's just not here anymore, but it needed to play itself out for four days, this cycle. Right. And I think this idea of moderation would creep in and be like, this isn't moderation. This is excess. This is too much. When in fact, like it just needed to ride itself out. And I think that's why sometimes when we don't understand the body's ebbs and flows or like the, that 
when we, when we do inherit this idea that like you should be eating a certain number of calories per day or you have a certain number of points per week, like, well, if we're overspending them, then this is obviously not moderation, right? Like there's something wrong with this. And then we have this binge response. And then I think that's just a cycle that, that repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. It took me back when you were talking about that too, when I was trying to implement intuitive eating and giving myself permission. I'd get those moments where I found that giving myself full permission really did quote unquote work, as in I didn't feel compulsive and out of control. I was able to eat these foods, feel satisfied and be able to stop before necessarily all the food was gone. So it felt like it was coming from me. And then I would have a moment like this and I would get excited about it and I'd be like, yeah, I've nailed it now. And then I would have another time where I would go and I would have something and then I'd be going back and forth to the kitchen and I would binge. And then that would happen. And then I would get a time when that didn't happen and then it would happen. And so there was a real sense for me where I was like, I can see how this permission thing works, but it doesn't work consistently for me. It mm. can't work consistently. And that was very much about thinking that there was something broken in me, my capacity to moderate myself. That came with a lot of judgment. I think what really did help for me is creating a bit of a gap between some of these foods because I've just done a post about this actually I haven't put it up yet but I've done an Instagram post where I talk about how I, I see myself as an impulsive person mm. I think I'm impatient and I think I'm impulsive and I don't think that delayed gratification is my strong suit yeah same so therefore something like moderation feels like a challenge and still does to some degree, not in the same way, because it's not this out of control, compulsive monster anymore. But there've been all these little things that I've had to do, like creating, talked before about the reactionary gap. Because I, I go through phases where I have food in the house and there's obviously I have food in the house where I have certain foods in the house. And then there'll be times when I don't. And sometimes I'll have food in the house and I will just feel a bit impulsive around I feel like I'm yeah. going back and it doesn't really feel like free permission if that makes sense it still feels a little bit like these foods are, are calling my name because I know they're there mm. so I had to find that balance between lucky enough to live close to shops to say I can go and get these foods whenever I want and that really worked for me because I felt really free to choose but it just gave me a moment to check in with myself, to slow down mm. my impulsive reactions. And I think there are people perhaps who might relate to this that think that intuitive eating is somehow supposed to get rid of the impulsivity around food. Mm. I think is yeah. not doing them a service because I think I am still impulsive and can be impulsive around food. Right. I, I agree. Well, this brings up the question of like, is like for people who find it like you're supposed to keep all your binge foods in your house, right? And I think there's multi, this this can be looked at a few ways. And I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think it's always the case that you just keep every single, although I've had clients who've done that, who've brought everything in. I had one client who was like, I have Doritos and and chips and pre chocolate covered pretzel. And it's just all over my counters. Like it's just taking up so much space. I can't even fit in my pantry. And that's how she wanted to do it. And she did. And it's fine now. But other, I feel like that doesn't work for everybody where, I think sometimes that temptation and it's, it is tempting. Like there's something about taste hunger and even the marking, the colors and some of the packaging, like it is designed to draw us in. Like it, it appeals to our senses in many ways, which as humans, we are going to respond to that. I think at this point, I feel like I've deconstructed shame and restriction and all these things so that I have, I do have some of that inclination sometimes to move towards something in quote unquote, I, I don't want to use the word excess um, because it doesn't feel like the same excess as a binge would have, but like more than I want to have. Um, and I have to be a little bit more mindful around that, but I couldn't have started by doing that. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't have put that in place. That wouldn't have worked for me in the beginning. I needed to have permission to have these certain things around me and see what happened and just, and just let some of that taste hunger go, like let it, let that be at first. And then I think where intuitive eating sometimes gets tricky is that I will stay in this cycle of thinking, well, I have to honor my taste hunger every single time. It's all about taste hunger. That's what intuitive eating is. If I want it, I have it. 
because my butt, my taste buds wanted in that moment or my eyes wanted in that moment. And I think sometimes that's why moderation becomes difficult because of this belief that that is what intuition really is. And it's not. And we can also give ourselves permission to say that appeals to my taste hunger, appeals to my senses in this here and now moment. But overall, I don't want this food right now. I choose to I choose to not have this food right now, not because I can't or because I'm shamed about it, but because I can tell that like it's it's appealing to my senses in a way that doesn't work with my whole brain. Mm-hmm. And that's why I need the pause. I find yeah. that with the pause, it's it works you know just find it a really helpful thing for me to do like your client I'd definitely gone through times where I'd brought in as much food as I could and so for a while I remember going through this during early days of my I say early days of my recovery because I feel like I was trying to recover the whole time it never sounds Mm. quite right while I was still struggling I can remember bringing everything in and having this idea that if I just had more food in the house than I could binge on in one go then I wouldn't binge because it wouldn't be the last supper eating, the having to get rid of all of it. And that would, that would again, quote unquote work until it didn't. Yeah. Until there was, and that, that I think was the confusion because it seemed like sometimes this is working and sometimes this is not working. If you want connection and support around any of the topics we talk about on the podcast, we would love for you to join our membership community. Members have access to monthly online support groups, a private Facebook group, live episode recordings, and member-only Q&As. If you would like to join us, please head to lifeafterdietspodcast.com forward slash community. Now let's get back to the episode. And don't you I mean, I feel like depends on our our stress, uh, you know, and our, our, the impulsivity can really depend on how tired we are, how stressed we are. I mean, right. So those parts of the brain are going to be more vulnerable in different contexts of our nervous system. Mm -hmm. So when I'm like this week, my kids ended school, there was this celebration after that celebration. I had like two graduate, there's graduations for like every grade. It was one thing after the next, the dog, you know, these things. And so my tolerance window was small. I was more likely to be impulsive about a lot of things, not just with food, but just with, (laughs) with, with all sorts of things. This will show up actually when I cook because I will make a mess. <laughs> like I'm a pretty organized person, but when I cook, it's my, I get this from my dad, I think. And, and my daughter calls me out all the time. She's like, mom, <laughs> she told me yesterday that I couldn't have been a good orthodontist because I wouldn't have had the patience to do the things they were doing to her teeth because you have to do this in this fine tuned way. Anyway, she's getting braces. That was another thing we did this week. Anyway, so my impulsivity is higher. And so when I'm cooking, I'll just scoop the thing out of the bag and just instead of measuring it or going slowly enough to not spill. (laughs) Um, And so I think that it's part of the brain that will just be more inclined to that, including with food, right? So like that will still show up. And so some weeks you're, you will be getting more sleep and have less stress. And so that would be a time where it would work, quote unquote, where it's like, I have this inherent pause that's available to me a little bit more versus a week where that's not true. And I think that's why it's this inner attunement to self and knowing where you are to understand how you might react. And so um, I also have a client who has an M&M jar, peanut and M&M bowl, so, sorry, in, in her kitchen, in the middle of her kitchen. And I think about that sometimes because I'm like, if I had a bright and colorful and sensory to me, I just want to dig my hands in that and like roll it around. Like there's something so sensory appealing about that to me. And in a week where I'm more impulsive, I probably, if I was walking through my kitchen, which I am all the time, I would probably be grabbing more of those because it would, in in higher stress weeks like that, just because, just because my brain's not all firing, like it's not very mindful, you know, it's just more like, uh, uh, like, you know, just grab and go, which to me is like, it's not a restriction that I don't have that bowl of M&Ms in my kitchen. It's not like, oh, I can't trust myself around them. It's just that I know that if I had that pause, I would probably want them, those M&Ms maybe sometimes probably after dinner or after lunch, I like a sweet, but not just between clients when I'm walking through the kitchen and I'm unpacking a back, a backpack and I'm just like, ah, you know, grab some. That's not something I want to do mindfully, but I wouldn't have that presence of mind in that moment. And so all of that can still be intuitive. Right. And I think that's where sometimes we're getting stuck. And I think even this conversation, I'm hearing myself say it and knowing that even potentially that might've triggered me 
when I was still recovering from restriction, right? So that idea would have been like, but that's still saying you, you know, that's still like, I, I just wanted, if I want the M&Ms, give me the M&Ms. Are you telling me that I shouldn't have them sometimes? And no, I think there's phases of this, but I think sometimes the confusion of all of that can, again, can even that can lower our window. And then we're grabbing for things and it's harder to be quote unquote moderate or have that balance because we have so many voices in our heads telling us what we, what's right, what's wrong. What do we need right now? What don't we need right now? Which nicely segues onto a live comment that oh. says, I've gone all in bringing in all the things. If I make it that I need to go to the store, I won't go out for it unless I'm in a really driven binge state. So that would be a way for me to control and restrict what I eat, which I think is exactly this. Like if you're in that control and restriction mindset, it's probably going to be helpful and say for everybody, for a lot of people to have those foods close and readily available that would not have been like an issue for me because I've always just happened to live very close to shops I can walk and be there in three minutes if somebody's got to drive 20 minutes not having the food closer could trigger off deprivation or restrictive thoughts or exactly could be a way to try to increase restriction and control yeah I don't know I think interest I'm just thinking back to how it has worked for me I never brought every single thing in nor did I because I didn't live like that close to shop. To me, going to a shop for food would almost activate more of a panic in a way because it would be like, wow, I'm I'm really going far for this. Like it would remind me of binges. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're saying that's exactly what this person's saying is yeah. that going out and driving would be exactly what you oh, said. Yes. When I lived in London, I used to, I was around shops then and I <clears throat> would go in New York City. I lived in New York City and I would go to the little place right around the corner and I would just buy like reams of biscuits. The, what are those chocolate covered biscuits that digestives? Mm. That's what I would buy. I would buy so many of those. But once they were in my house, it was like, I'm binging on these now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then I would be compelled to eat all of them because I knew I wasn't going to go buy them. Yeah. It's, it's complicated, but it's, I think our, I mean, the moderation question I think is really, I would have at one time been inclined to blame my physiology but I think so much of it is, is what my mental process was doing. Like all of the talk, which is why that moderation was so difficult. And the black and white thinking just is so easy. It's just so quick. And then moderate moderation is the opposite of black and white thinking, right? Like it's not, it's that uncomfortable gray area sometimes. Well, the two just fuse together, right? Mind and body, like our biology responding to yeah. what our mind is telling us, what we're believing, that anticipation just thinking something can create hormonal or biological changes in the body so yeah it's probably both yeah I also think like sometimes it is it is difficult to stop eating something that tastes really good like you know what I mean I think we pathologize that and I I mean I find it freeing just as like yeah well of course I mean this tastes really good it's it's immediate gratification um and if you're, if we're in the habit of doing that, and if we're developing a story around, see, see, I don't know how to control myself, which would have been in my head, then we are just living that out time after time after time. You know, it feeds on itself. Well, the part that I imagine is the most confusing for people is exactly that. Yes. Okay. This tastes good. And I want to keep eating it, but now I'm feeling sick and my body is kind of complaining and I'm not feeling great and I still want to keep eating mm. more of it it's that kind of split between body and mind and maybe like brain chemistry and body chemistry is kind of at odds with each other yeah. in that moment mm -hmm. that I think is where where people are getting the most uh, frustrated with themselves yes. and thinking that this doesn't make rational sense yeah. Well, there's the mental hunger that could be continuing, right? Like our psychology still wants more because maybe there is some restriction still in there or that emotional escape, right? So again, if we stop, then we have to face that we just ate it or that we're feeling sick now because of it. So it's like, I think the mental or the, and, or the emotional process can halt, can, can create that, that sort of cycle. And I'm conscious of how we talk about it here. Sometimes I'm like, yes, it's very clear to me the way I talk about it here. And then sometimes I'm like thrown back into the memory of being inside of it, being like, no, <laughs> it's so I, it does. And then none of it, it's like, oh, that feeling. And I just need to say this because there's times where I'm like, I just remember that. And I'm like, 
it doesn't matter what anyone says. How do I get out of it? How do I stop? Like, I can't stop this. All these things make sense. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't compete with the feeling of it. I feel for my past self in that space. And I feel for anyone listening in that space of feeling like you're just in it. And that's like, it's tendrils are in you and you just don't know how to, how to stop the cycle. Mm. Well, what used to really annoy me is listening to anybody talking about how they got out of it always sounded so vague. Yeah. Right. Well, I just kind of did this and then I did some journaling and I accepted this and I, yeah, I realized I this accepted. and I'm like, yeah. I know those things, but yeah. there's still that, that block. And I, I think it just really speaks to, for me, that there was that desire. I really wanted somebody to map this path for me. Yeah, I know. Another, another reason I think sometimes moderation is difficult is because we've talked about this a bit in a different episode, but where food, food is inherently pleasurable, right? So it's designed to have this reward response. And when our lives shrink, either because of dieting or, and, or binge eating, right? So we start to diet, we start to maybe not go out as much because we need to keep to our, you know, our food regime, or I've gained weight and I don't want people to see me, or I'm, I just had a binge and I'm not going to go out. And now I'm not going to, I'm not really engaging in my hobbies anymore because all I'm thinking about is how to lose weight now. And that's become my hobby. And this, my so all of a sudden we're creating, we're, we're actually magnifying the reward center of food. We're taking something that is inherently re- pleasurable and making it even more pleasurable because now it's got all this charge around it and our lives have shrunk so much that we're not getting the pleasure from these other sources anymore. And so it again stands to reason that then when we're eating, it's going to be hard to stop because this is our chance to, to light up the parts of our brain that respond to pleasure. And that is, again, inherently re- like we want to do that. We're humans. That's part of our makeup. So we it's this again, this cycle that's not very clearly there's no clear way out of that. It's not like a step you take of like, here's how I here's, here's how I create pleasure around food that doesn't just revolve around food that's a lot easier said than done. Um, so for the time being, it's like, well, food's going to light that up for you and you're going to want to stay there. Right. So you're not going to want to stop. Um, which I think can, it's part of, it's part of the, it's part of that larger picture of, which is why I think this process can take a really long time because sometimes it is about doing what feels absolutely like it's taking a lot of opposite action on engaging in things again, or, um, self-care, which can even feel counterintuitive when we want to self-punish um, or feel that we deserve, we don't deserve these things because, or we have to get our weight under control first, you know, and then, you know, it's the expansion of pleasure that I think sometimes is part of the antidote for, or part of the antidote for that feeling of, I just want to stay in this moment with food. The whole idea of like brain chemistry and reward is something that I feel like is really important to talk about in this field, but in such a nuanced way, because I know what I kept doing with the black and white thinking. I would be like, well, I know these foods, they hijack my brain. I don't act like this around any other foods. So therefore the solution must be to cut out these foods. And I kept coming back to that, trying to cut out these foods, then triggering off more restriction and deprivation that way and going around in that cycle. So I just want to name that. And there are people out there who will say, I gave up Mm. these types of foods because I can't handle it. I'm convinced that my brain is wired in a way that cannot handle it. Mm. And what would be, what I'm going to throw this at you. What would you say to those people, Steph? So I think that for some people, it's reasonable to say around these foods or being around these foods exceeds my capacity at this time. Like the pleasure I derive from this food And the amount in which I want to consume that food to feel that is so big that it's going to overwhelm, you know, like the zone of proximal development, right? Like there's a point where having something is too much. And I believe that. And I think that, again, for some people, this food right now isn't within my capacity to be around. Sometimes that's helpful. And it's like starting smaller. It's like, well, can I start bringing in other foods or having other foods around that are a bit more out of my comfort zone, but not too far out of my comfort zone where I can play with some of this, where I can, I can try to inject more pause and incorporate some of these ideas I'm learning about. But if we have all of those foods or if we have too many or certain ones that are particularly triggering, I, I find, um, I hear this a lot with granola, ice cream, peanut butter. Do you hear what else? What else? I feel like those are Pro- like the three protein bars, but granola is a big one that comes up a lot. Yeah. Granola is big. Mm. Um, 
that sometimes it's like, okay, well, then maybe framing that idea as I can't have this food around me right now, but not I can't ever. I'm addicted to it. My brain can't handle it. It's I don't think that's true for me anyway. It wasn't. It's just like I think there's tears of of moving through this sometimes where we don't want to flood ourselves to the point where then we're helpless. We, it's like a learned helplessness at that point. But maybe there are increments of integrating foods that can happen in a slower way. And I've shared this before, probably a few times now, how for a while I knew I had to separate television from these foods. I just had to because I couldn't, there was something that when I was kind of in that numbed state with TV and I consumed those foods in that state that I didn't seem to be able to stop. And so I've shared this before for two months, I would sit at the table it was excruciating at times, but I had full permission to eat these foods whenever I wanted to. The only condition was I had to sit at the table and do my best to enjoy it. And I wasn't allowed, didn't allow myself to distract myself or look at any screens. That I feel was so powerful. And when I started, I didn't know how long I was going to do it for. I didn't know if it was a forever thing. I didn't know if it was going to be a month or two months. And in the end, I, I stopped after about two months and it felt okay. Mm. So I think we can get into these compulsive cycles with food that may not be about the restriction element, the dieting element that we talk about a lot and thinking about how can we support ourselves through that? Yeah. There's another question that's come in. Do you have any thoughts about moderation with regards to nonstop continued eating all day long? Kind of what, I mean, yes, I was there. I was absolutely there for many, many years. It's a lot of what I think we brought up here is like pleasure being one. I think with that, when that's something we're engaged in all day long, what room is there for much else? It becomes this, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. There's nothing else. <laughs> like this is constantly, it's a preferable thing to be with and the nothingness that might be if we have nothing outside of that. To me, that's that's the, the mind frame that I experienced that in and why that was so such a self-perpetuating cycle for myself. To pause through that and to stop was unbearable as far as what thoughts would start coming up and the feelings I would have. And then the lack of, like, it's, it's then a, a very acute absence of pleasure. It's like actively not eating when I'm used to be eating all the time and having these hits. Um, stopping that cycle is like stopping a moving train. You know, it's it's harder in the moment. It's one of those things that when momentum's going with that, moderation's going to be a huge feat. I would say that moderation wouldn't even be wouldn't even be plausible at that point. It would be a much more incremental way of shifting things. That's going to look a lot like what somebody else might still call overeating or binge, uh, but to me might be progress. Even being able to stop that for a little while or to be able to do something different for a little while or engage with someone else for a little while. Um, I think moderation is too far a reach at that point. When I have those days of sort of just eating constantly throughout the day, and even now if I have a picky day, there can be the sort of sense of feeling like I'm chasing something that never arrives. And something that I really appreciate about meal times is for me, meal times feel like they really punctuate the day. They give me a sense of real rhythm to my day and structure to my day. And it transitions from, you know, breakfast into doing some work. And then there's a break time. So lunch is associated with a rest and a break. And then there's a wind down with the evening. So there's something I, I love, I love the times of day that meals are. Yeah. I call those meal anchors in my course because mm -hmm. they feel like anchors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's wrap it up. Time flies and having fun. There's always <laughs> a really weird sense of time. Sometimes Steph and I will be in the middle of an episode and then we'll go like, I think we're there. And it'll be like, no, we've done like 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and other yeah. times we just go and go and go. There are times when, yeah. <laughs> it's about? not consistent. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us live. Yes. Those of you tuning in on the podcast. Yeah. All right. All right, then lovely people. So I really enjoy doing these live episodes where our community get to come and join us and interact with us during the episode. What does our private community have access to? Well, our community is for anybody who listens to the podcast really and resonates with our content and wants to dive deeper into it. We offer monthly online support meetings that we run together. We offer regular Q and A's and you can join us for live episodes. And the Facebook group. We have a private community group on Facebook who 
a lovely group of people who are interacting with each other, supporting each other, sharing stories, asking questions. And Sarah and I are also involved in the group on a weekly basis. Yeah, we strongly believe that there is so much healing to be had in communities of like minded people, which is why we offer this membership. So if you'd like to join us, there is a link in the show notes, as well as a link in our Instagram bio and on our website, lifeafterdietspodcast.com. And it's been a little while since we've asked for some reviews. We haven't asked people for reviews for a good few weeks. We were supposed to ask regularly and asking people to share the show. So those of you on yeah. social media, I really appreciate it every time somebody shares this show and their stories. Yeah, word of mouth is one of the best things for podcasts to reach a broader audience and get more no, to reach to reach a broader audience period <laughs> period so okay. thanks everybody big thank you to everybody who joined us live from the community we appreciate you so much and if you want to be appreciated by us too <laughs> come join the community 